Welcome to About Time, a new travel show segment for kids where we voyage through time to connect with amazing women who made history. I'm your host, Girl Friday, and today I am lucky enough to have traveled back to the 1800s to speak to First Lady Dolly Madison. Dolly served as First Lady while her husband, James Madison, was president from 1809 to 1817. She also held the job as White House hostess when Thomas Jefferson was president. Dolly had more parties than any First Lady in history, using dinners and drop-in squeeze events to make important connections and collect information for her husband. We are so lucky to have Dolly here today to chat. So it is so wonderful to have you here today, Dolly. Thank you for coming. Well, thank you for having me. Do I call you Miss Girl Friday? That works for me. <laughs> what should I call you? Is Dolly okay? Mrs. Madison or, or Mrs. Dolly Madison? is just fine with me. Okay, well, Mrs. Madison, we've heard so much about you from history books, and we know that you're a really great entertainer. Can you tell us a little bit about the parties that oh. you had? <laughs> Well, first I have a question for you. Sure. If you don't mind. You called me First Lady. Oh. What is, is that a title that in your own period now that you give to the wife of the president? Yes, exactly. Oh. So that's a term that mm -hmm. we give to the wife of the president. So the First Lady of the Land, I think, has been one of those titles or names okay. that she's referred to as. Um, but First Lady, I think, is after your time. Oh, something it more contemporary. Was, because you know, we did. Uh, our citizens didn't know what to call the first three um, First Ladies. <laughs> um, <clears throat> now that I know the term, uh, Mrs. Washington was called Lady Washington. They wanted to give that respect, and we were not. Um, we were such a young country, and no one knew what to call the president's wife. And I believe that Mrs. Adams was called Lady Presidentress, Madam Presidentress, and me, <laughs> they didn't know what to call me. Uh, they called me, I would have preferred Mrs. Madison, or just Dolly, but they called me Her Majesty, <laughs> or Madam Presidentress, or Queen Dolly. I think it's because of my turbans, I'm not sure. <laughs> but I thank you for that term. I didn't know what, I wasn't familiar with that. But you asked me about my entertainments. What kind of entertainments? Whenever I could have a party, I did it. There was nothing for anybody to do. Nothing. There was no theater. There were no theater. There were no concerts. Nothing. So we invited everybody. We, I would put an. I would put um, a piece on Wednesdays into the National Intelligencer which was our newspaper, and it went to everybody's house in the morning. Or they could pick one up, and it would have, <clears throat> would announce that there was going to be, we called, I call them drawing rooms, not squeezes and not levees, <laughs> but drawing rooms, a little more refined. And everybody could come, and they would come for many reasons. Some were young people, like you. If you weren't married, they would come to meet other young people, to socialize. And some were, um, of course, the congressmen and ambassadors, we called them ministers at that time, and others would come to climb the social ladder. Now, my darling little Madison, he was not shy, but he was, um, he was not as good as greeting people as me, not as comfortable. I wasn't either at first, but you learn. I wanted my husband to be successful. So if somebody talked about a piece of legislation, I would say, why don't you come and talk to the president? So I, I did that for a number of reasons. But my entertainments there, there were pass-around um, refreshments at those because you couldn't sit down anywhere. So I would do that. Then we had another kind of entertainment, the teas. We had teas, and men were welcome to those too. We had another kind of entertainment, which I probably suspect you still have now, they were big, big dinners where you sat down at a long table. And it was very unusual that the president sat me, his wife, at the head of the table, at the head. 
Usually it's the president. But he knew that I could keep conversation going. He was somewhere in the middle <laughs> of the uh, table uh, on one side, and I would direct the conversation. So what kind of food did you serve at those parties? I've heard yes. that you served ice cream, and I know we that did. there weren't these <laughs> things called refrigerators back then. No. Refrigerators keep things cool. That is so right. So how did you have ice cream? Well, it was homemade, and there was a lot of ice. Um, it was freshly made, and people loved it, so we had to eat it rather quickly. I was not the first to serve it. Yes, ice cream was served about every kind of entertainment I had. Otherwise, um, the pass around foods were of nuts and cakes, uh, wine if people wanted that, tea, or, um, or one of the things they loved at both the teas and the, and the drawing rooms. There were sugar candies, and I would wrap, have them wrapped in white paper, and when people undid them, there would be like a little verse inside either poetry or some sort of literature. And that would get conversations started for people. And for the dinners, oh my goodness, <laughs> we had hams, we had courses, hams and turkeys and beef and vegetables. And at all the uh, entertainments, I did have fresh fruit too. This is Madison. <clears throat> I, when I throw dinner parties, I have so much trouble balancing talking to people with cooking. Oh. How did you do all of that? Oh, I didn't cook. You oh. cook it too? Yeah. Oh my. Oh no, we have servants. We had servants. And for our big, big uh, parties, uh, where there was lots and lots and lots of people, especially the more formal ones, we did bring in some of our slaves we, some of them were working in the house, in the president's house. There were very few paid people. I had a major domo. He was a gorgeous man. Never, all the ladies liked him. His name was Jean Soissant. And he was French and he spoke French. And he was very handsome. But he was also very good at um, guiding me in how to entertain like the Europeans. And so I did that with a dash of American flavor, because I didn't want to be like, of course, the royalty. But we had cooks in the president's house. I did none of the cooking, none of it, or cleaning, or any of it. I was free to entertain. One of the other life experiences that our viewers really want to know about was the portrait of George Washington. <laughs> there is a lot of discussion in history books about what you did. Did you tear the painting off the wall? Did you no. save it? What happened? Well, my goodness, I'm surprised that that is still interesting to people. Yes, I did save it. Um, and I saved it for a very good reason. I knew General Washington very well. My sister Lucy, she was married to um, General Washington's nephew, George Steptoe Washington. <laughs> So I knew them well. And also, as I was going through the, the house, all of you must know, I guess you must know a little bit about it. It was within hours of leaving <clears throat> the mansion, the president's house. The pa portrait was hanging in what was the dining room at the time. And I respected General Washington so much. He was the hero of the American Revolution. He won the war for us, was one of the big reasons. And I thought, oh my goodness, if the British do enter the president's house, they would love to have that portrait and parade it through the streets of London or burn it. Or, and I thought, no, no, that is not going to happen. You could just see what was going to occur. And I thought they did not he was not defeated in life. At that time, Mr. Washington, uh, General Washington was gone. He was, he was dead. I thought they will not defeat him in death. So I did order it taken down. It was not cut out <laughs> of the, we had to do it quickly. The portrait was not touched. We carried the full portrait, frame and all, <laughs> out of the president's house, out the north side of it. And there were people, two gentlemen were passing from, um, North Carolina, and I asked them if they would take it to safety, and if, 
And if the British stopped them, because they were entering the city at the time, if they were, saw that they were going to be stopped, I asked them to destroy the painting before the British could, wow. yes, before they that could uh, destroy it. That is an intense story. Yes, it was. So, so did you <coughs> return home to the White House after? We left, after the, we left the house, uh, we were one of the last to leave, I was, and uh, we went to Bladensburg, <coughs> to an inn there in Virginia, to meet my husband, who was off with his troops. And we were to meet there, and we did at an inn. But yes, I did stay for a, a bit of time in Virginia and went back into the city two days later, as quickly as I could. And my darling little husband was there too. We couldn't stay, everything was burnt to the ground. I, I saw the president's house still smoldering. It's still a sight that I will never forget. We couldn't stay in the city, so we did leave, and we came to Montpelier, um, our home in Virginia, and returned as quickly as we could in August. We never returned to the president's house. It was being rebuilt. Can you tell us a little bit about what you are wearing? I know you're <laughs> also really well known for your fashion, and your dress today is so beautiful. Well, thank you. Can you please tell us a little bit about your outfit? Absolutely. My gowns all came from Paris, France. And as you can see, they are empire-waisted gowns, and um, they were all fashioned for me there. I never visited Paris. I would like to have yeah. sometime, but I didn't. I would ask people that I knew who were going to go to, to Paris, and they would send me back beautiful garments like this that I could wear. And my headpieces were made there, too. I loved beautiful jewelry. That's the one thing I love about not being a Quaker. <laughs> I can wear beautiful clothing. And um, sometimes my feathers were very high, very tall, and I was easy to, easy to spot in a crowd so that people could come to me or I could move about and they would know where I was. A lot of, of first ladies and presidents had pets when they yes. lived in Washington, D.C., what we call the White House <laughs> now. Can you tell me if you had any animals? I did. I did. I had a very bad macaw. <laughs> it was a, a large parrot. Beautiful. He was, a, he was a military macaw. Green and very, very beautiful. I called, uh, I don't know if it was a he or she, it's hard to find, it's hard to know if a macaw is a girl or a boy, but I called her Polly, just in case. <laughs> and she was a very bad little bird, but everybody loved her. She could always be counted on to do, to attract attention, and people would focus on Polly, and I could move among people, socialize with them, and they would want to, to see Polly. I was always worried, however, that Polly would say some very nasty words in French because French John taught, her, taught Polly to say them. As far as I know, she never did in front of the French minister's wife, who was a dear friend. I would have been very embarrassed, but Polly was a lot of fun. So you told me all of these amazing stories yes. about your childhood, about the parties you had, about the war and saving George Washington's portrait. What do you want to be remembered by? How do you want to be remembered oh, in remember. history? Oh my, um, several things come to mind. I haven't really thought about that um, because my husband, the president, the um, author of the Constitution was the most important person and everything I did as his true partner in life, um, he saw me that way as his helpmate. I would want to be remembered, I think, as being a partner, which women were not thought of at that time. And more than the portrait, saving the portrait, what comes to mind is I was very influential in helping to save the capital after the fire of um, when the British burned it from being moved because people wanted to move the capital to their own home states, like Philadelphia, which had been a temporary capital before Washington City was built, and New York. And I thought that was wrong. If it had been moved, the British, in a way, would have won. 
would have won. They would have succeeded in chasing our democ democracy from our nation's capital. And George Washington had laid the foundation. He laid the first block for the president's house. I wanted to see it rebuilt. So I began, if I might digress for a little bit, when we moved back, I began treating the city just like it was always going to remain, the capital. It was hard, but I began right away bringing people in for drawing rooms to Octagon House. I began having parties. And when the Treaty of Ghent was passed, declaring the end of the war, I threw the doors open of Octagon House and we had a big party right there. I would want to be remembered for that. Also, there are many children and wives who are misplaced after a war. We don't forget about, we don't uh, remember the aftermath, but so many children were homeless. And so I and my friends started a, an asylum, was called back then, but it was an orphanage for children. And we did do that, and it was called the Washington City Orphans, Orphans um, Asylum. And we built that within two years. I was the first directress <laughs> of it. Uh, we put a piece in the paper advertising that we, were, we wanted all the women who were interested in coming to start this asylum to uh, um, come to what we called the brick capital then. It was built very quickly uh, right across the street from the capital that was being built, <laughs> rebuilt. And so we met there so people could see it. And, um, I was, I was elected the first directress, and I donated $20, which was a lot of money back then. And a, but I did something else, Miss Girl Friday, that I think was even more important. To keep something like that going, so people will continue to support it, I would go in various places of the city and do what I called my delicious work. I would sew clothes for the children. and. If everybody knew, if any woman knew that Miss Doll, that the Queen Dolly was going to be there, they came to help. And that kept a lot of money coming in. And I'm very proud of that, that we took care of the children of, of the war, the victims of the war. And that I was a partner to my husband, and that the city was saved. To me, that was much more important, although I'm proud that people remember <laughs> saving the portrait. That, to me, was much more important. Well, Mrs. Madison, thank you for sharing all your remembrances. I do have a few questions from kids. Okay. They know what a great hostess you are and okay. what a great socialite you are. And so these are advice, column, uh, advice questions geared towards these kids. So I'm going to read you these letters. And if okay. you can come up with some answers for mm -hmm. these kids, they would be really grateful. And it sounds like you really enjoyed helping out kids. I do. <laughs> Dear Dolly, I'm at a new school this year and I want to make friends, but I'm not sure what to talk to them about. Can you give me some tips for starting conversations with potential friends? Sincerely, the new kid on the block. The new kid on the block. <laughs> you put people at ease. If people don't come up to you, then you go up to them. Go up to somebody that you think you'd like to know and just be honest with them that you're new and you'd like to know um, oh, something about them. People love to talk about themselves. And if that's not easy to get into, then you have books. I always carried a book. I always carried a book. And whether I had read it or not, it didn't matter. Because I would say, have you read this book? And if they had, then we would start conversation. And if they hadn't, I'd say, well, I have started or I haven't. What is your favorite book? You get them talking about themselves. You show interest in people, genuine interest. You have to be a friend in order to have a friend. I hope that makes a little bit of... That does. Mm -hmm. Here is one more. Dear Dolly, I'm hosting a birthday party at my house and I want everyone to have a good uh -huh. time. Can you give me some tips for being a good host? Thanks so much, party kid. <laughs> When people come to your home, the first thing you do is greet them. And you thank them right away for coming to the birthday party. 
and you make sure that they know everybody in the room. Do you know anybody here? Is somebody you don't know? And you go over and make sure that everybody is known. Games are a very good way of getting people to interact with each other. Make sure everybody has enough to eat. You know, if somebody will not start, go to the table first, sit down, invite somebody to come. Why don't you come over and start? If you start, then other, other people will come and sit down too. Make sure everybody has enough food and they have everything they want and make sure you thank them for coming again and for whatever gift they might bring if they bring you a gift and show how much you appreciate it, whether you do or not. <laughs> and that's, again, it's not hard if you just show that you want your guests to have a very good time. Does that help a little bit? I think so. And I have one last question to wrap it up. Dear Dolly, I've heard you saved a portrait of George Washington. How did you decide which objects in the White House to preserve? And are there any portraits of you in the White House? Oh. Sincerely, a young preservationist. Oh, well, yes, there is a portrait of me and of um, Mr. Madison. Mine is, they were both painted by Gilbert Stewart, who was the painter of the large portrait of General Washington. Mine happens to hang at what is now, uh, I, I don't know what room it is, but one of my salons. But it faces the portrait <laughs> of George Washington even now. She can see it, I, I can see it. I have my eyeball on it still. <laughs> but I saved a lot of other things. Mr. Madison had asked me when he realized that the city was going to be attacked we finally realized it. He asked me to pack up the papers of state, the papers of state, and I did. I packed those immediately and sent those to a safe place. And then um, anything I could take um, as I went through the last time, silverware. <laughs> I grabbed silverware, anything was small that I could pick. Oh, but I did save something very large that I packed into a trunk. I loved my long, long red velvet curtains, and I pulled them down from the long windows, and I packed them into a trunk. I wasn't about to leave those. So it wasn't really a decision exactly. At the last minute, it was anything I could save, I did. Well, Mrs. Madison, I am so excited that I ended up here with you in the 1800s <laughs> and that we could chat about your experiences as what we now know as the first lady <laughs> in the White House. Um, thank you so much for joining us. This was well, a really lovely for conversation. Thinking, thank you for thinking I'm important enough to visit. Uh, you'll have to stay for some tea. Can you stay? I will definitely okay. stay. Thanks so much for joining us for this episode of About Time with Mrs. Dolly Madison.